Let's dive right in. This tutorial shows a quick approach to making space-filling Voronoi models. The original intention here was to mimic what you can achieve in Grasshopper using Blender, and this could be applied to making metal foams, porous networks, or even just interesting 3D prints. I'll note that this is a bit of a crude approach compared to what you can achieve with a more purpose-built solution. I'll be using Blender version 3.6 for this video, but it should be applicable to other versions. As always, there are timestamps below. In a new scene in Blender, we're first going to enable the Cell Fracture add-on by coming to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and we're going to look for Cell Fracture. For our example today, we're going to convert a simple rectangle into a Voronoi object, but the basic approach will work for any object. I'm going to start by selecting the default cube and resizing it into a rectangle, Scale, Y, 1.5, and Control a to apply that scale. To get the cell fracture to work well, the object needs a minimum amount of geometry, so I'm going to tab into edit mode, right click and choose subdivide, and hit shift R mm, three times. From here, with your rectangle selected, use your search function, that's F3 for me, and we're going to look for cell fracture. If you have the add-on enabled, it should be right there. I'm going to go ahead, hit enter, and I'm just going to use the default settings. I'm going to wait, let Blender do its thing. You can see it's created this inner network mesh. And I have all the fragments. While they're all still selected, I'm going to hit M and move them into a new collection that I will simply call Fragments. From here, I'm going to hide the original mesh. So hide the cube right there in the viewport. I'm going to right click on the Fragments collection, select everything, so select objects. I will shift and click one of the fragments. Control J to join them all together, tab into edit mode, hit M and merge by distance. You should see a number of the verts have been deleted, so we're nearly ready to export, but we're going to add a little bit of space between the individual segments. And to do that, we're going to change to individual origins using the period key. Then we're going to hit S to scale, and we're going to scale in just a tiny bit. I find that 0.95 works pretty well here. All we're looking for is this little space between the segments. Now, our object is a single object at the moment because we merged all of our fragments together. We're going to export this as an STL and take it over to voronator.com to get a .plY file. So we'll start by coming to File, Export, and go to STL. And then for the settings, I'm going to choose select only, and we'll export that file. We've moved over now to voronator.com, which I've linked in the description. Voronator accepts several file types, but I find it's best to stick to STL based on what Blender can export, because some of the other options, such as OBJ, the files will get very large very quickly. All we're going to do is choose to upload a file, and we're going to grab the one that we just created. I find the default settings work fairly well, but there are advanced options if you'd like to try and explore some of the things that they can do. Simply go ahead, press Start, and we're going to wait for it to give us a result. The larger your file, the longer this process will take, but I find it's typically done in under two minutes. Once Voronator has finished processing your file, it's going to give you two options. Download the first one, otherwise you're going to get something with a significantly lower mesh density. Navigate to wherever you'd like and simply save the .plY file. Back in Blender, we're going to hide our original mesh object. Then we're going to come to File, Import, and you can choose either Stanford PLY or just .plY. Navigate to your file, select it, and go ahead and import it. You might find that you're going to see a bit of a pause here, depending on the size of your mesh object as it loads in. But what you'll notice is if I load in the original object, you can see that this is not actually mapped over exactly where the cracks were. It's not even mapped into the area where the cracks were formed on our export mesh. This is just a rough approximation, and I find that Voronator needs that little bit of extra disordered geometry to get something that will give you a convincing-ish result. Let's note a few things here. The first is that you will need to play with the process bit if you have a specific result in mind. If you just want a Voronoi shell of a 2D object, you can skip the cell fracture portions of this tutorial. Cell fracture is just ensuring some internal geometry is present to create the space-filling 3D Voronoi network. A quick editing note here. Before working with this any further in Blender, it's a good idea to use Merge by Distance as the models can be very large when imported. The tutorial example here has around 438,000 verts on import. 
Very simply, I'm going to select Model in Blender, tab into Edit Mode, hit M and use Merge by Distance. Now the default setting in Blender is something like 0 0.0001. In this case, you can see that I've increased it up to 0 0.0125. And that was just through a little bit of exploration. But it's going to cut the model down by nearly 320,000 verts, making this much more lightweight and easier to work with. From here, I'm going to do a remesh by coming to the Modifier tab, adding in a remesh modifier, and I'm going to use the Voxel remesh. For the size, you'll have to explore a little bit, but I'm going to use the same size as the Merge by Distance. So 0 0.0125, Enter. This will take a little bit of time, but from there I can go ahead and apply this with Control A. I find this is also a decent foundation for sculpting, so if you want to, you could come to the Sculpting tab, and then you could inflate or smooth parts of this to make it either a finer mesh network. I'm going to hit F here just to drag this up. And then I'm just holding down left click and kind of painting to create something a little bit more fine in terms of the structure. And if I wanted to use something like the inflate brush, I could also bring that over and just use that to sort of paint in thicker or thinner areas. Take this back to the layout tab. One thing that I will note here is that I really do not recommend using subdivision surface on these as they can get very, very large very quickly. And if you really felt that you needed to to get something a little bit better, then you could apply a remesh modifier again here. From here, coming into a rendered view, you can see we've got a reasonably intricate little Voronoi 3D mesh network that we've custom shaped. And if we wanted to, we could of course continue working with this in Blender to add things like lighting materials, which we'll cut back to now. So in this example, I've set up a simple background, given this a metal material, and added a basic HDRI just to have a rough sense of how this would look as a porous metal network. If I wanted to easily and quickly change the thickness, I could simply tab into edit mode, A to select everything, and then we'll do this in solid view so it'll be a little bit faster, but Alt and S to just move in or out. So I'm going to hold down Shift and make these a little bit thicker. Now, if I wanted to take something like this and 3D print it, then I would probably want to use something that has soluble supports on the interior, as otherwise this would be a relatively difficult thing to clean up. If you really needed the result that I showed at the beginning of this video from Rhinoceros Grasshopper, then to the best of my knowledge in Blender, that would require either custom programming, it might be possible with Fairshock, and we may see that in the future with geometry nodes. For now, this is a quick and easy approach to get this kind of construct from pretty much any geometry. So hopefully this will help anyone looking to make some quick space-filling Voronoi models in Blender. And with that, thanks for coming in. A special thank you to Dave from UC Berkeley who asked about this specific case. Even though this is a crude approximation, it's been an interesting challenge, and I will try to revisit in the future to give something with better precision. It is a reminder that when I do get requests, they often do make it into tutorials or into specific assets. And I'd like to specifically thank my Patreon supporters who helped make these videos possible, especially in the context of my next video, which will cover the asset library for scientists that I've been working on for the past few months. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, consider subscribing, joining the Blender.Science community on Discord, sharing this channel with your friends and colleagues, and until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.